Recently, my mother-in-law told somebody that when my wife and I were attending Bible school in New York State as teenagers, basically, that when we came home, we had been set on fire and we were able to change the youth group in the church because we were able to somehow ignite the flame there. And the thing that she pointed to in particular was the fact that we had been ignited to be worshipers. I want to talk to you this morning about a subject very related to that. Your God and my God, as we've already heard, which is how I was incidentally going to open this service, and then Brother Bill said what he said. Our God is an infinite God. He's the almighty, infinite God. And I want to encourage you this morning that there is more about God than you have ever experienced. I came home from Bible school with a a driving passion that has never died, realizing there's more of God than I already know. More of him than I already have. And that's still the truth. It has been driving my life for 50 years. And... um, the Bible says that God is so infinite in the book of Ephesians. He says that we are he's going to unveil the riches of his grace forever. In other words, the Lord's just going to peel back himself as we get to eternity like an onion, only there's no end to the onion. He's just going to keep peeling back glorious revelations of himself. As the, the book of John says, Now are we the sons of God that doth not appear what we shall be, but we know we shall be like him when we shall see him as he is. As we behold the glory of the Lord eternally, we are literally going to be changed over and over and enlarged. And it's we we can't even comprehend this side of eternity, what that's all going to be like. Since I was a young boy, I've been asking the Lord for more of the Lord. When I was 12 years old, I was attending a church over on the what is now the service drive. It wasn't the service drive then. It was the 10-mile road at the time, or 9-mile road, excuse me, at the time. And uh, there was, I had a wonderful pastor. I had, he became my pastor when I was five, and he was my pastor until I was 15. So, and I, I really loved him, and uh, it was an interesting thing. I, I shouldn't take the time to do this, but I'm going to. <laughs> Years ago, I, I think I told you this story, but I, years ago when we were living in the apartment over here, or the Sunday school wing because we couldn't afford to rent a home or buy a home and uh, the church didn't have enough money to do that, so we just lived in the Sunday school wing for four and a half years. I was praying because in my youth, basically speaking, because our neighborhood completely dis, uh, moved away from the area, um, They actually tore down our high school. Um, I had no contact with basically any of my past associates, including Bible school, because they went off in a direction I couldn't follow, and so I ended up not being part of that either. And one day I said to the Lord, I would really like to meet somebody from my past. And in just a couple weeks, the phone rings, and there's this old shriveled voice on the other end, and he says, hello, is this Mark Byers? And I said, yes, it is. I knew who it was already just by the tone of his voice. He said, this is Leslie McKay. I said, Brother McKay? That was my pastor. He said, yes, I'm in town from Kentucky. And I heard you were pastoring, and I thought it would be nice to come and see you. <laughs> you couldn't have picked a more important person from my past to come and see me than Brother McKay. (laughs) 
And so I was privileged to take him and his wife out to dinner and spend the afternoon with them. Had a wonderful time. In fact, his oldest son, his oldest daughter, um, his younger daughter and his younger son were all matched up with my siblings. And the two of the older two went to college with my two, my older sister and brother. And um, the younger two, my brother dated his daughter and I was good buddies with his youngest son. So this man was very involved in my life. His family was involved. But I got to spend time with him. But one time he made a mistake, just one big mistake. And um, I didn't hold it against him, never have, but it was a mistake. And I, he had an altar service, and he would have incredible altar services. When I was a boy, four and five years old, six years old, seven years old, I, we began attending his church when I was four, actually four, not five. And, um, and uh, we would have altar services and the Sunday evening services Sometimes it would last till midnight. And uh, the presence of the Lord would come, and Brother McKay would be sitting on the front pew just singing and worshiping the Lord. And it wasn't a Pentecostal church, but kind of acted like one. And um, it was funny. I met a Nazarene pastor. He was Nazarene, my Brother McKay. I met a Nazarene pastor recently of a rather large Nazarene church. And I was talking to him and sharing some things about my life. And he said, can I pray for you? And I said, sure, brother. And so he laid his hand on my head and he began praying for me. In the middle of his prayer, he started speaking in tongues. And then he went back to English and that was the end of the prayer. So when he was done, I looked at him. I said, brother, you just spoke in tongues. He said, yep, do all the time. I said, you're, you're a Nazarene? Yep. He's a, he was the assistant pastor. I said, does your pastor know you speak in tongues? <laughs> he said, yes, he does. I says, does he speak in tongues? He says, not yet. <laughs> but anyway precious precious guy well the Nazarenes didn't believe in speaking in tongues but my pastor McKay had an incredible ability to lead us into the presence of the Lord and I remember weeping at the altar at five and six and seven years old and we would be there sometimes till 11 o'clock and even 12 at times but one time there was a service over here in Ferndale and we went down to the altar and he was just encouraging us to ask the Lord what we wanted him to do in our lives and so I didn't know it but everybody else had left the altar and I was the only one there I, I had I was so engrossed in praying it's only 12 but I, I I literally was unaware that everybody else had left the altar and finally he came over and he knelt down next to me put his arm around my shoulder and said Mark, what, what do you want from God? I said, I just want more of God. Have you ever prayed that? We sing it, more of you, more of you. But I literally was praying, I want more of God. Brother McKay said, son, you already have all of God there is. That was the big mistake he made. That was wrong. Other than that, I can't remember a single mistake. And I thought to myself, if I have all of God there is, God is pretty wimpy. And I knew he was wrong. And I began seeking the Lord at 12 years old. I began seeking for more of God. Notice what Paul says. I'm going to read some significant sections if you want to follow along. Philippians 3, you know this section. I'll read it quickly, but I want to make the point that I need to make. Chapter 3, verse 10 in Philippians, Paul says, that I may know him. Now, you got to realize, Paul's writing this near the end of his ministry, that I may know him. <laughs> well, Paul, you already know God. It's like Moses, Lord, you say I found grace in your sight. If I found grace in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you. And literally, he's already delivered Israel, as we've heard this morning. He's already uh, been given the Ten Commandments, and, Paul, and Moses is saying, Lord, I want to know you. Well, here Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, 
Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Now, when he says, not as though I had already attained, I want you to understand he wasn't talking about physical resurrection after he had died. Because it's, ir it's, it's irrational to think that, that he was talking about that because he said, not as though I had already attained. For him to have already attained the resurrection from the dead that he was praying for would have meant he would have had to have died and raised from the dead. He wasn't praying for the resurrection from the dead after death. He was praying for the resurrection of Christ in him, the resurrection of the Lord being formed. And then he makes it clear, either we're already perfect. I wasn't, I'm not already mature. There's more to know of God, and I want it. I want that resurrection of God to be in me. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the prize, the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had a passion to know the Lord in a deeper way. Philippians 3.8 says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He says that right before the other section I just read. Hebrews 12.1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the goal. Knowing the Lord is the one that we are running after to win. Paul and John, the writer of Revelation and the other scriptures, clearly had heavenly encounters with the Lord that they weren't even allowed to tell us about. Did you know that? They had revelations they couldn't tell us. Which means they, were, they had a deeper understanding than we have and that we have available to us from scripture. And the idea in this generation is if you get a revelation that's greater than anything in the scripture, you've got to be an error. Well, you would be an heir if you shared it. They weren't allowed to share it. And if God gives us an understanding of things beyond the pages of Scripture, he's going to say, oh, by the way, don't share that. Paul said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether in the out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was cut up to the third heaven. He's talking about himself. All Bible scholars believe that this is what he was saying. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. He doesn't even know whether he was in the body or out of the body, but he knows he went up. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. He said, I saw things that I am not allowed to even express it would be unlawful for me to tell you what I saw. John says this in Revelation chapter 10. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he cried with a loud voice, and as when a lion roars, and when he cried out, seven thunders, thunders uttered their voices." Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. He heard them. He heard them so clearly he was about to write what the seven thunders said. And the Lord said, uh, don't write those, seal them up. No one else is to know about that. That's kind of an unusual idea, isn't it? That God could give us revelations that are so wonderful we're not even allowed to share them. These two men give examples in scriptures of that happening. I get envious of people who've had glimpses of the next world. But I know this. I've at least got the glimpse of the next world to know that there is more in God than you or I have. That was inspired in my life by ministries that I have sent under. And I know that there's more because men like Paul encountered more. 
And after he encountered that more, he was never the same. All through the scriptures, there's been men who longed after God. And all through the New Testament era, there have been men who longed after God. One man wrote in the in a bio, uh, autobiography of Smith Wigglesworth. It says, he said the, he was praying with Smith Wigglesworth. And he was dis- determined to stay in the prayer room with him. And in the end, he finally had to crawl out of the room on his hands and knees saying, it was too much of God. Smith Wigglesworth was preaching in England. And the woman who invited him to stay at her home with her husband's permission, who was not a Christian, gave up their bed so Smith Wigglesworth could sleep in their bed. And she was hoping the whole time that Smith Wigglesworth would pray for her husband and seek to lead him to the Lord. But he never was able to do it. And the last day he was there, his alarm clock didn't go off on time. And so he had to jump out of bed, get dressed and run down the street to get to the train on time to make it to his next destination. And the woman yelled at him as he's going out, Brother Wigglesworth, I wanted you to pray for my husband. And he said, turned around and said, Don't change the sheets. And she thought, what in the world is he talking about? What did you say? Don't change the sheets. So she decided not to change the sheets. That night, her and her husband got in bed, and her husband was laying on the pillow that Smith Wigglesworth had been laying on. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and the power of the presence of the Lord came on him, and before that night was out, he had fallen on his face, accepted Christ, and repented of his sins. What was that? It was the power of the manifested presence of God. We can walk in that place. You and I can. When I was in Bible school, I met some men who... I thought we're heading toward that place and we're almost there. In fact, some of them I think I thought were there. Men like Enoch and Elijah, they were really spiritually way ahead of me. And they were way ahead of me, but they weren't quite as far as I thought they were down the road in the journey that we're on. Quite frankly, as I've known some really powerful men, I have been privileged to be introduced to some of the most powerful leaders of the revival that took place in the 60s and 70s that are in the entire nation. One of them was a man named Judson Cornwall. He's the one who set my life and my wife's life on fire for worship. You are worshiping the way you just worshiped because of the life of Judson Cornwall. I've been privileged to know and sent under the ministry personally of Bob Mumford and others that I won't even bother naming. Wonderful men. But as I got to know them deeper and deeper and deeper, I realized they weren't where I want to be. They were farther than I am, farther than I was. But they still didn't have what I believe is available in Scripture. My prayer is I want to see the Lord, like Daniel and Paul and John saw the Lord. They were just men of flesh. Those men are no different than you or me, but they somehow laid hold of God in a way so much deeper than you or I have had that my prayer is that I want the same thing. I'm not talking about men's anointed gifts. I'm not talking about ministries and opinions and abilities. I'm talking about the glory of of God. And I'm not talking about a little glory spell where you go, oh, glory, and we fall on the floor and shake around and say, oh, God, bless me. I've seen people do that, and afterward I've said to them, so what did God say to you while you were down there? Uh, nothing. So God knocks you down, makes you shiver all over the floor, and you don't even get a single word from God? That doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm talking about the glory of his presence. And let me say this about the glory of his presence. 
This may somewhat confuse you, but I hope by the end it does, I make it clear. The glory of God's presence will not make you feel good. It will overwhelm you. We know that from scripture, Daniel chapter 10. Therefore I was left alone in this and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me for my comeliness was turned into corruption and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Revelation says, then I, John, fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead and am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell. John, that closest disciple to him, falls at the feet of Jesus as though he were dead when the Lord revealed his glory to him. That's how much glory there is. And John's writing the book of Revelation at 96 when this takes place. One of the things I'm sure of this is that you will never find a person mentioned in Scripture who encountered God and His glory that ever backslid or rebelled against God again. They were all changed. You can't turn away from Him after you've experienced His glory. And I'm not talking about an argument or a doctrine. I am talking about having an experience where you meet God. I have had experiences where I've met God, but I don't have had, I have not had the experiences that equal what I want to have. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. He did not say, I know what I have believed. He didn't say, I know about the one I have believed. He said, I know whom I have believed. In our church world today, the Christian community, are having more man encounters with the entertainment and the programs that they're producing, more of that than a God encounter with an, in, an impression made by God by his power and majesty that they can't escape. What we need today is more Damascus Road experiences like Paul, like Saul had that changed him from Paul. Now, in the scripture, we know this about the Lord. There's a thing in the scripture that theologians call the omnipresence of God, which simply means that God is everywhere. But there's also in scripture a thing called the manifest presence. That's what it's been called by men. And the omnipresence of God simply means that he is everywhere all the time. In fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can check this out on the Internet. Science does not know what holds the atoms together because the way an atom is constructed, it should not stay together because there's negative and positive charges and there's a whole bunch of positive charges in the middle of an atom and they're there being held together. But have you ever taken a magnet, two magnets with a positive and a positive and put them together? It drives them apart. They don't want to stay together. Well, in the middle of an atom, there's all these positive charges and they should blow the atom to pieces. But for some reason, the atoms in the universe stay together. Well, it's been called the God particle. The Bible says that he upholds all things by the word of his power. The moment God's word becomes unfaithful and untrustworthy, the whole universe is going to turn into one gigantic explosion. He is holding it all together by the word of his power. The Bible says that he has made everything and without him was not anything made that was made. God is everywhere and he's holding everything together because of his mighty power. This explains why a man can be sitting in a bar, inebriated almost to the point where he can't walk, and all of a sudden he'll become under conviction, his mind so numb he can hardly think, and all of a sudden that alcohol has lowered his inhibitions, and he's able to begin thinking about God, and he begins, as we say, crying in his beer over his condition, and he even sometimes will repent in that bar for the way he's chosen to live. What's happened there is there's a hunger put in every man by God, for God, and only God can fill it. And when the man is inebriated to the point where he can't resist that 
presence in his being, that move, that hunger in his heart, he's able to start vocalizing some crazy passions for God that he forgets the moment he walks out of the bar and gets his mind back. But when he leaves, he his hungry heart inside hasn't bowed to the Lord's authority. He hasn't submitted his mind to the Lord's authority. He hasn't submitted his life. And he is on a rest, he has on a journey and he has the recipe for misery because on the one side there's a hunger that exposed itself in the bar and on the other side a rebellion that refuses to submit to it so he's a miserable man. As we've already heard this morning, if God can do that in a bar room to a man sitting on the bar stool who's absolutely inebriated, there's nothing God can't do all by himself. He can do whatever you need to have done for your life, as we've already heard. Incidentally, that's right in my notes. Brother Bill was dead on center this morning. In fact, it is said that most people who come to the Lord do not come to the Lord in a church. They become convicted outside of a church through some other place. And that's why you're called to go outside these doors. And we got that little sign out there. You're entering into a mission field. People will become more open to the gospel outside of a church or a religious service. These instances are illustrations of God's omnipresence. However, there's something called the manifested presence of God. Even though God is everywhere, at times he concentrates his presence in a greater way, and we call it the manifest presence of God. When this happens, as at the altars that I've told you about and services I've been in through my life, I, I was in a service one time where the presence of God, this was in Bible school, came. And a um, young man in the front was speaking. The presence of the Lord was powerful. And this young man, who was a, happened to be a very spiritual young man, was speaking in tongues. And when he did it, he would speak out like he was giving a command and the rest of the students near the front would answer him in tongues in unison. They would all say the same thing in tongues. And I was new in this spirit, you know, speaking in tongues thing. And here I'm watching this guy speak in tongues and give a command and probably 15 or 20 students answering him in tongues, exactly the same words in tongues. And this went on, this service lasted about four hours. It was a tremendous anointing of God's presence. There are specific times when God is more here than he is there. It's not the omnipresence of God, it's his manifested presence. The Bible says that King Uzziah, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne and high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. God can continue to come in. The train of God is like a big, long robe, and he can just continue and continue and continue to come in. Like the man said, praying next to Smith Wigglesworth, there's too much of God. I can't take it. God chooses to concentrate and reveal himself more strongly to one person to, or to another one place more than he does another place. God is always there. He's omnipresent. But God is also willing to manifest himself in a greater measure. That's why he said, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Why seek his face if we've already got all of him there is? What are we seeking? If we've already got it all, why seek his face? What other level of him are you seeking if you've already got it all? It's because his favor flows wherever his face is directed. God wants to show us his face. And he wants to see your face. It says in an open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord. God wants to see your face. God wants to hear your voice. God wants to meet with you personally. People say, well, God's face is always turned toward me. Well, that's not necessarily true. How many of you know that you can have a child who you have become disgusted with, but you still don't put him up for adoption? 
He's still your child and you still love him. But he's naughty. And he's been disobedient. That's what the Lord said. If my people which will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. If we will turn our face to the Lord and our voices to the Lord and lift our hands to the Lord and we will seek the face of the Lord. <coughs> the Lord will turn his face toward us. It's almost as if we are called to reach out and take God by the face. And say hi, like a little child. I want to see you. I want to know you. When I was in Bible school, one of the things that changed my life the most was when Brother Justin Cornwall came and taught an extended series on the book of Song of Solomon. Turn to that book with me. That's the one right before Isaiah. It's not after Psalms. It's right before Isaiah. So if you can find Isaiah, you'll find the Song of Solomon is right before it. Can you see this Bible from down there? See all that writing? This was the Bible I had in my hands when Judson was teaching. And I was writing notes as fast as I could in the column of my Bible. Since then, I've had two of these. And um, now I've got my this version here that has my writing in it. But I want to read just the first four verses. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. You know, the Song of Songs. Do you know what that means? This is the greatest song Solomon wrote. Some believe it's the greatest song that's ever been written. And it's got more truth than any song that's ever been written since. This is the Song of Songs. That's quite a name. And it says, which is Solomon's. And this Shulamite woman speaks out and says, the king, it appears, and it's believed what was happening is the king was going by, Solomon was the king, and this Shulamite woman saw him, and she said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine, because the savior of thy good ointment, thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. It's as though she, the Solomon went by and this woman saw the king and she was mesmerized by him. She was drawn to him. We would say in this generation, she was turned on to Solomon. She wanted Solomon she looked at Solomon and wanted to be his wife. And she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That word mouth in the Hebrew is let him kiss me with the kisses of his speech. I want to hear his voice. As the Bible says, for sweet is his voice. She says, verse 4, draw me. Draw me. We will run after thee. Then she says, the king hath brought me into his chambers. What she is saying there is what I'm trying to communicate to you up front this morning is God is looking for you and for me to say, I want more of you. Draw me. I want more of you. Taking God as it were by the face. Lord, I want more of you. I've talked to you about generational transfer to you young people. Young people, let me tell you something. You have an encounter with God, and I don't care what condition your parents are in, you will be drawn because you will have seen the king. My mom and dad were good Christian people. They didn't even go to the same church. My mother would not submit to my dad's authority, spiritually speaking. Otherwise, yes, but not spiritually. She was more submitted to her own father than her own husband. And her husband was the only one that was right between the two. My dad was a man who knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, but, and he had a, he was, had impeccable character in almost every area, but he was not a gentle man. He wasn't a kind man in so many ways. I had wonderful parents, but they were not what I wanted spiritually. But they raised six kids. 
And somehow my father particularly was able to plant within us all a desire for truth. And we were all raised, as I mentioned earlier, in a particular denomination, a holiness church, a good church. But it didn't go as far as I wanted to go. And as we grew older, all separately, five of the children, and my oldest brother is 15 years older than me. He just turned 84 and he's still a missionary in Botswana, Africa. My oldest sister was like two years younger than him. She died as a missionary in Japan. My other brother is still a missionary in Guatemala. I just talked to him yesterday. He just arrived in Dallas from, he has home in Dallas and a home in, in Guatemala. He just got back from Guatemala. My other brother was Jay, who pastored in northern New York and also did missionary work to, the, to uh, Cree Indians up in Hudson Bay area of Canada. And then there's me. And you know what's amazing about it? All five of us separately ended up getting filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, including our wives, totally separate from one another and from my father. <coughs> he ended up attending a Pentecostal church before he died. But we were all crying out, draw me, show me, reveal yourself to me. I want more of you, Lord. And we all ended up finding out more was available. And this Shulamite woman, when she says, draw me, she says, then we will run after thee. In fact, if the Lord draws you, you will be able to draw other people. If God draws you, others will run with you. You're sitting here today listening to me speak. Because a long time ago, God drew me. And now we together are running after him. Draw me, she says, and we will run after thee. You cannot experience the drawing of the Lord and the, the encounter of God and the supernatural revelation of God, the manifest presence of God, without being so changed that everybody you interact with will either love you or hate you, or they'll follow after you and run after God as well. But there's another thing she says in that same verse. The king hath brought me into his chambers. Brothers and sisters, let me show, uh, sh share something with you. You and I do not have the willpower to become mighty men and women of prayer and worship and the seeking of God. But we have the willpower to say, draw me, Lord, draw me. I long for you. I lift my hands. We sang about it this morning. We lift our hands, we draw near to him, we seek him. And when we seek him, he says, okay, I'm going to do a miracle and I'm going to draw you. Nothing will turn God's face toward you more than you seeking his face. It's kind of like a child, if he was, a, you had a young teenage, not young, but a teenage child or young adult child who was in rebellion. And they came and said, Mom and Dad, I, I want to apologize. I want to repent. I've been rebellion against you, and I want to repent. I want to restore our relationship. I want to have an intimate fellowship with you, and I know that to do that, I've got to walk with God. I want to walk with God. How many of you would realize your heart would be incredibly drawn to that child? And that's what happens when we seek God. He's drawn to us. When you say, Lord, look at me, see me. I'm seeking you, Lord. He'll look at you and say, now I'm going to draw you. Bible says he wants to guide us with his eye. Can you imagine having a relationship with God where he says, I guide him with my eye. I got these two little puppies well, they're not puppies anymore. They're three-year-old dogs. And I'm teaching them to obey me without speaking. So when I have cookies, little, little doggy biscuits, and they come up and they hear me dink the little glass container they're in, they come running from wherever they are. If Boog, 
uh, Rachel and Scott's dog, if, if he's upstairs in the bedroom and he hears the dink, he comes down and I got three dogs begging right at my feet. And so they're always jumping on me. And the little guy, my little male, he's about 16 or 17 pounds. He looks like a, a terrier. He looks like a little boxer, just a big shouldered little guy. He'll jump and hit me between the back of my leg and he'll almost knock me down. And so I don't like it. And so when they come to get their little treat, I'll just go like this. And I'll just point to the ground. And they'll both sit down. I would like to be able to look at them and go. <laughs> I might get to that place, but at this point, it's. And they sit down. Or if it's time to go to bed, I'll go. And up the stairs, they run and jump into my bed. They're learning. I'd like to be able to go. <laughs> Guide him with my eye. That would be kind of neat to have a dog that you can just go. <laughs> God wants to guide you with his eye. Not just his voice, not just his word, his eye. He wants to have such an intimacy with us that he can guide us with his eye, the scripture says. Psalms 32, 8 and 9. Are you tenderhearted enough that God can guide you even with his voice or with his word, let alone his eye? Are you tenderhearted enough where he can say, oh, you, you can't go there? Or you can't do that? Or you're not to say that because it will displease your father. When Peter was in the place of the high priest's house, which I've been there. It's an interesting place. I've been in that very house, in that very courtyard in, in Israel. And, um, I mean, they know exactly where that was. And Peter was out there warming himself in the outer court where Jesus was meeting with the high priest and all those people. It's very clear that Jesus could see Peter because the scripture says Jesus turned and looked at him. Peter was there, and he literally curses the Lord. I don't know him, and curses. I don't know the man. What are you talking about? And all of a sudden, the rooster crows, and Jesus turns, it says, and he looked at him. It's all Jesus had to do, and Peter melted into a sobbing mess because he realized he had offended his Lord and Savior. It's interesting what the scripture says, talking about creation. In Isaiah 66, 2, it says, For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will look. Now, when God says, on this one I will look, he has eliminated every other people except this person. Under this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. The Lord says, I'm going to look at this man, which means he's not looking the same way at all of us. Oh, he sees you. He knows you. You're his child. You're born again. You've got his spirit. But the Lord says, on this one, I'm going to look. This is this man that I'm going to give a special look to. This is the man who's going to get my face turned toward him. This is the one that is going to see me in a fresh way. What is it? A person who is of poor and contrite spirit and trembles at his word. That's why he tells us to seek his face. Every time we gather together, we have a promise that the Lord is going to be here with us. But how many of you have been in services where you know God came in a special way. Even this morning, and when we opened this service, how many of you recognized as, as Bill got up and said, God's here? God's always here. He's always told us he'd be here where two or three are gathered. Every time the worship team worships in the morning and opens the service, the presence of the Lord is here. But today, if you're sensitive, you were aware that there was more of God than there was maybe some other service. How many of you will raise your hand and testify you know that's true? 
You see what I'm saying? There is an increase of what God can pour out of his presence. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night and were so hungry for God that you got up in the middle of the night and found a place of seclusion to pray? When was the last time you were in the middle of your evening and you weren't at work, had no responsibilities, and you just simply had to go get alone with God somewhere? That's like a child reaching out, taking the face of their father. I've seen little kids do it, and it's so sweet. You'll see a little kid grab their mom or daddy's face, and they'll, they'll just turn it like, look at me. God wants us to grab him by the face and say, please behold me, O Lord. His face should be our focus. We all beholding the glory of the Lord are changed. He wants to show us his glory. In fact, not only does he want to show us his glory, he wants to share his glory with us. People say, God doesn't share his glory with anyone. That's what Isaiah says. No, we're not anyone. We're him. We're his. He's sharing his glory with himself because we are his children with his spirit. When David began talking about bringing back the ark to Jerusalem and setting it up in a tent in his backyard, he wasn't talking about the gold-covered box with those special little items inside of it. What he was wanting was the flame of God's presence that we also heard about, the pillar of God, the fire and the smoke. Wherever the glory of God went, there was victory and power and blessing. Intimacy will bring victory and power and blessing. But if you're seeking the blessing and not intimacy with the Lord, your focus is wrong. Pursuing blessing won't produce intimacy. Pursuing intimacy will produce blessing. It'll produce an intimacy with him that produces all sorts of blessings. When Moses exposed himself to the glory of God in the book of Exodus chapter 34, he came down from the mountain and his face literally shined, physically shined with the glory of God. <clears throat> it's interesting, most people think that he covered his face so the Israelites couldn't see it. That's not why he covered his face, not, not according to the book of Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3 says in verse 13, Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away. Another translation says, We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. He put the veil on his face so they couldn't see that glory dissipating until he went back into the presence of the Lord the next time. As you expose yourself to the presence of the Lord, the glory of God will settle. settle. <clears throat> when God begins to visit a place or a people, things start to happen. I remember a few years back, we were experiencing some really wonderful times here at Calvary, and we still do. But this was a special time. And I remember a relative of one of the staff wanted to borrow something I had. And I was experiencing some real meetings with the Lord. And I said, sure, she can borrow that. She just come by the house and get it and pick it up. So she came over and she was a high powered executive. She was anti God, didn't want anything to do with God. But she came to get it because she needed this thing for a Christmas display. And she thought my little item would be a Nice addition. She walked into the house and she stood in just inside my vestibule doorway and I had gotten the piece that she was looking for. And she says, yeah, you, you're really, you and my, my brother are really busy, aren't you? I said, yeah, we're just trying to build the kingdom of God. And this hard, calloused, anti-God woman instantly started to sob. 
And she didn't even know why. She says, I don't know what's the matter with me. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't, I'm not this kind of a person. I never act this way. What's going on? And I just looked at her and I said, let me introduce you to the presence of Jesus Christ. I can guarantee you she'll never forget that event. She encountered God. When Jacob was coming back to Israel, he wanted to get to Bethel, the house of God, because he knew everything would be good if he got back to Bethel. And when he got there, it says, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. When Jacob got to Bethel, the terror of God came on the inhabitants of the land. I read a story <clears throat> about a man named Scott McGregor. How many of you have ever heard of Scott McGregor? No baseball fans here. Scott McGregor was a pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles and played in the 1983 World Series, and they won the series in Game 5 when he was pitching, and they were the score was 5-0, to zero and he won the game for them. After his Major League Baseball career was over, Scott McGregor became an assistant pastor, a youth pastor. And in the church that he was working with, one of the pastors tells the story that he had a brother-in-law who was an atheist. And I'm going to just read this to you because I don't want to mess it up. In fact, he wasn't just an atheist. He was an evangelistic atheist. In other words, he was promoting it. His, this brother-in-law was the kind of guy whom you wanted to avoid at family gatherings because he always caused trouble and started he heated arguments. In the middle of God's invasion of this church, a real move was taking place, this brother-in-law called the pastor's wife, who was his sister, and said, Look, I'm flying in. Would you pick me up? I just want to spend a couple of days with you. The pastor knew something was up because this brother-in-law had never done that before. When he arrived, it was obvious that he didn't know what he was doing there. It was the strangest thing. There they were, trying to make conversation with, with each other when they had nothing in common. They talked about the weather, then they ran into one of those awkward, long silences in the car coming back from the airport. As they passed by the church, the pastor said, That's the church. We just finished some remodeling. Since the brother-in-law had never seen it and figuring out it was another way, yet another way to plug an awkward moment of silence, the pastor said, wouldn't you want to go in and look at it, would you? To his complete surprise, his atheist brother-in-law said, yes, I would. The pastor pulled into the church parking lot and then unlocked the door of the church building. His brother-in-law was right behind him and his wife was third in line. The pastor stepped inside and held the door open for his brother-in-law, and the moment the man's foot touched the floor on the other side of the threshold, he crumbled into a heap and began to weep and cry. My God, help me. I'm not ready for this. I don't know how to do this. What am I doing? Then he grabbed the pastor and said, tell me how to get saved right now. The whole time he was writhing on the floor and cry, crying uncontrollably. So this pastor led his brother-in-law to the Lord right there while he was sprawled half in and half out of the building while his sister patiently held the door open. Her atheist brother had an encounter with the residue of lingering the lingering presence of the glory of God. As soon as he regained a measure of coherence, they asked him, what happened to you? He said, I don't know how to explain it. All I know is that when I was outside the building, I was an atheist and I didn't believe that God existed. But when I stepped across that threshold, I met him and I knew it was God and I knew I had to get right. And I, I felt horrible about my life. It just took all the strength out of me. What could happen in a city or region if this strength of presence expanded beyond the localized area of the church building? When I look at the United States and the condition we're in, it sickens me. Because I remember it when I was 10, as I campaigned for Richard Nixon for president. I remember what it was like. A lot of things were wrong, but not like now. Now, 
We are three steps down the road to total perdition. We've denied God. We've embraced murdering babies all the way up to the moment they're ready to come forth out of the womb. And we've accepted homosexuality. And now they are promoting pedophilia. <clears throat> this nation is in a mess. But you know where I put the blame? On the church. Because we gave up the manifest presence of God for order, for programs, for entertainment. And A.W. Tozer was writing about it in the 40s, trying to turn the church away from the direction we were taking. The church has lost its anointing, but we need to get it back. It needs to start somewhere. There was a revival back years ago that started in a little church on Azusa Street. Many of you don't know this, but it was a little black congregation. And the Holy Spirit was poured out in the United States. And the reason we speak in tongues and the reason the gift of the Holy Spirit has been established in the church was because a little black congregation in Los Angeles on Azusa Street began seeking God. The Holy Ghost fell and it spread through the whole world. There was revivals in Europe under the praying supervision of men like praying Hyde. Charles Finney would come into a town and he would go out into a field and he would seek the Lord for two or three days. People heard him praying three miles away. Then he would come back to the church and preach. And he said this, I read his autobiography. I never went to a single church where we didn't have revival. We can look at Calvary and I can look at Calvary. And I remember when I came to my first service and there was four people and one visitor. That was my first church service. I can look out here and say, oh, we're in revival. I'm, I'm, I am thankful for everything that's going on at Calvary. But it's not what my heart's longing for. There's more to be had. Light drives out darkness, darkness, and the prince of the power of the air is just in the air. Jesus has come, put his feet on the ground, and he has dispossessed him. He spoiled him. He's stripped him by the power of the cross. When Jesus was walking on the earth, he walked into the area called Gadara. The Gadarenes. The Gadarenes were part of the tribe of Gad. That's why it's called the Gadarenes. And when he stepped into the, off the boat into the tribe of the Gadarenes, the tribe of Gad and the Gadarenes, the demon-possessed man began to cry out. In fact, the different Gospels give a little different view of it, that they said, there are many of us. There's lots of us here. And when Jesus said the name, he cast them out into the pigs. This group of Israelites had so deteriorated in their commitment to the Lord God of Israel, they were raising pigs in direct contradiction to the word of God. Not any wonder the Lord let them go into the pigs. And then they ran down the hill and drowned them all. He got rid of the pigs in one big sweep. Basically saying, we don't do pigs in Israel. But you know what the Gadarenes did? They came to Jesus and said, please leave. Please leave. But the man who had just been delivered begged him to go with him. And he said, no, no, you go back to your family and tell them what God's done for you. Brothers and sisters, we need to get God in this house. So many people are taking up with God's power. And we can too. Let me tell you, if God poured out his power on your life and an anointing came and when you laid hands on people, they were healed and they were delivered and they were demons cast out, you would be amazed how fast pride would blow your head up until the place. Like, like Brother Mumford said, you know, that would be like putting an air hose to their head and anointing them with an air hose and blowing their brains out. He said, there's times that I'd like to have a laying off of hand services where we could suck the air back out. I mean, that's a quote. They're taken up with power. You know what that's like? That's like somebody giving you a power saw, hand saw, and you're so mesmerized by the saw and what it can do, you fail to surrender it to the carpenter of the universe so he can show you what he can do with the same power. 
I've got chainsaws at home, and they're, they're powerful chainsaws. I got four of them. And one of them's got a blade that's that long. And it's so powerful, I can hardly, par I can hardly start it. And when that thing starts, man, you can just feel the power. And I can tear into a log that big and rip through it like it's butter. Just, I love my chainsaw. <laughs> That's the way most people are when God gives them a gift. I love this power. God's not looking for us to love power. He's longing for us to love him. He's the reward. As I said in Sunday school, Jesus made the statement, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. How many of you know the name of Jesus? One of his names is life. He wasn't talking about abundant living and abundant resources. He was saying it's straight as narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leads to life. But he went on to say something else. Do you remember the last part of what he said? Thank you. Few there be that find it. Don't you want to be one of the few? Don't you want to be one of the few that find life with a capital L? I want you to think for a moment as I bring this to a close. What is the high watermark in your Christian experience? When I say high watermark, I visited with my wife the um, Mount St. Helen disaster not too long after it had happened. And if you know what happened there, there was a tremendous blast equivalent to 500 times more powerful than the bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It wiped out 250 square mile of front of timber, some of the logs three and four feet in diameter, busted them right off like they were toothpicks. <clears throat> but you could look across the valley and there was a mountain on the other side of the valley and there were trees all above it and there was a line and there was no trees but dirt below it. And we said, what, what happened there? They said when that mountain blew, it was the greatest landslide in the history of the world. And it came down that mountain at 150 miles an hour. And it went into Crystal Lake, a huge recreational lake. But before that landslide hit the lake, the blast from the, the uh, volcano came out sideways and not upward. It was the first time they had ever seen that happen the volcano blew out sideways and it was blowing rocks at 350 miles an hour, the size of Volkswagen Beetles. And when that came out, it hit all these trees before the landslide got to the bottom of the mountain. And then the trees are flattened out. Literally, they look like a, just a great big giant field of toothpicks or pickup sticks, but when you got next to these trees, they were three feet in diameter. And they were, they didn't have any limbs on them, they were just simply bare. They looked like a bunch of telephone poles. But when Crystal Lake emptied, after these were all flattened, Crystal Lake came down, or the, the, the mudslide came down, filled Crystal Lake, and it splashed up onto the other side of the valley, and every single tree that was knocked down was washed down from the top of that hill and there, that mountain and there was literally not a tree to be seen on that hill. The watermark was literally as distinctive as you could possibly imagine. I've got video footage of it. Brothers and sisters, what's the high watermark spiritually in your life? What caused it to be the high watermark? What were you doing at the time that made it to, that you can refer back? I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to be honest. 
maybe you can't answer this, that question that I just asked, but how many of you can think of a time that you believe you know was the high watermark of your spiritual experience? Raise your hands. High watermark. What caused that to happen? I'll tell you what caused it. The presence of the Lord came in a special way. He is not seeking people who are looking for his benefits. He is looking for people who are seeking him, his face. You know, it's an interesting thing when you study the life of Moses. If you study it carefully, write these verses down. You can look them up. Exodus 24, 13. Exodus 24, 13. Exodus 33, 11. Exodus 33, 11, and Joshua 1, 1 to 9. If you've ever wondered why Joshua became the successor of Moses' leadership, those verses will tell you. And it was because when Moses went up the mountain to meet God, the Bible says Joshua went with him. And when Moses would be in the tabernacle meeting with God and come out, the Bible says that Joshua stayed in the tabernacle. And he worshiped God and met God. And when it came time to replace Moses, the Lord said, Joshua, you're the man. As I've been with Moses, I'm going to be with you. Why? Because Joshua was seeking God when he was just a young man. And Moses was just his hero. I want you to bow your heads. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. If you wish to kneel where you're at, feel free. If you, we come forward so often, there's almost no room right now, and I have no problem with that, but I don't want to do that today. There's a song that we sing, More of You. More of You. I think most of you know it. Can we? I think we can do it by memory. I've had all, but what I need is just more of you. Of things I've had my fill, and yet I hunger still for more of you. When we sing that, if that is your prayer, set your affection, your attention, your mind on the Lord and sing it, not just as a song of worship, but as a prayer. Every head bowed. I think what I'll do is have you, if you really are praying this as a prayer, just lift one hand up before the Lord as we sing it. More of you, more of you, I've had all, but what I need is just more of you of things i've had my fill and yet i hunger still empty and bare lord hear my prayer for more Just more of you, of things I've had my fill, and yet I hunger still, empty and bare, Lord, hear my prayer for more. Ah, uh, 
I've had all but what I need is just more of you of things I've had my fill and yet I hunger still, empty and bare. Lord, hear my prayer for more of you. Father, we have sung that as a prayer. We've declared to you we want more of you. And we're asking you to draw us that we might run after thee. Give us that grace, that strength. You said it's both the Holy Spirit to both will and to do of your good pleasure within us. Give us the willpower, the strength, the grace to run this race and pursue you. If we are of any other mind, as Paul said, show that to us and cause us to be repentant and turn and seek your face that we might attain to the knowledge of the resurrection of the dead. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you will hear our prayer, that you will answer our prayer, and that you will truly draw us in Jesus' name.